uh, today I was looking at some court records involving Devadasis in the late 19th century in particular. I was looking at the document of the first trial that occurred in the Madras presidency uh, for the dedication of a minor child to a temple and um, I was really shocked at the tawdry um, nature of the judicial arguments as well as uh, with the authorities they quoted to make the point, to make the, uh, the false case as I now believe it to be that the Devadasis were a class of prostitutes. The one thing that strikes me in looking at these legal documents um, that, are, that occur in various publications of the judiciary, journals and so on from 1870 onwards, is the straight prejudice that was shown by the courts against the Devarasi. Um, the ignorance that they displayed about the lifestyle and uh, the lack of investigation that they actually made into who and what she was. If there had been no understanding current in India at the time as to her real place in the system, uh, one might say that the judiciary was trying to err on the side of justice as it was then perceived, but the fact is they did have uh, writings and experts at their disposal who could have updated their knowledge and showed them that the Devadasi was in fact being used by social reformers of the time as an ideal victim. Because if you look at the, the crime reports from the same period, I'm talking about crime reports compiled, for example, by the chief of police in Bombay, but taking into account the whole of India, you find that the section on vice, and one of these reports actually has a section on prostitution, does not even mention the Devadasi as being a part of that problem. The problem was in India in those years a large one, as it was throughout the world and always will be. But in India it was particularly ugly, if you believe these reports. I mean, women are found in cages along the streets, in barred cubicles with metal bars, not to confine them, but to protect them from the violence of passers-by. So they're kind of caged there as uh, the prostitutes of the time. And there were other huge vice problems involving women, not only from India, but also from Europe, mainly Eastern Europe, who were then residing in India. Why then did they light on the Devadasi as the, as the heart of this problem? This is what I've been asking myself. And the only answer can be is because she was convenient. She was a convenient victim, easy to identify, dancing out there in public, and uh, confined. You know, you knew where to, where to find her, you knew where to locate her. She was at the local temple. She wasn't like the rest of the prostitution problem, difficult to get your hands on. She was easy. She was convenient. Moreover, she was a very convenient stick for beating the authorities of the time. You know, the social justice activists that were going to destroy the Devadasi 
also wanted to use her as a stick for beating those elements in society whom they considered to be empowering her. For example, they could use her as a stick to go after the colonial administration, they could use her as a stick to go after the justice system, uh, to go after the Maharajas who were entertaining her in their courts, to go after the Zamindars. You know, she was great. She was just exactly made for their purpose. But all they had to do in order to keep her in that position was to demonstrate by insisting that she was a common prostitute. Now, in the cases that I've been looking at, I, of course, came across the very first one, which um, went to trial in 1869 and was appealed by the Devadasi, who was then imprisoned for uh, two years, rigorous imprisonment. Her name was Padmavati. She appealed this decision and eventually had her sentence reduced to 18 months. But essentially, the crime of which she was accused, which was that she had purchased two minor children for the price of a neck ornament and 35 rupees from a mother who was selling these children. Now, this was common practice among the poor in India at that time. And the real question for these parents who could not afford to look after their kids or for one or another reason did not want to have girl children and there were many reasons why it was very inconvenient and often devastating financially to have girl children in India. The question for them was what best way to dispose of them? I mean, do we sell them to the pimps? You know? Or do we give them the best chance they have, which among which choices the life of the Devadasi was one. Why? Because such a child would at least be educated, taken care of within a system, uh, given a means of earning a livelihood, and ultimately uh, enjoy a life that within the system, whether we approve of it or not, that within the system of the time gave her a certain honor, a status. And uh, so it seems to me that if it had become impossible or undesirable for one reason or another for parents to dispose of their girl children, this was probably a fairly good choice, you know, to, to let them become adopted into the Devadasi system. Now, with, uh, regarding the question of whether these Devadasis were, as they were branded by the reformers, whether they actually really were common prostitutes, uh, the literature from the time is very unreliable because all of, most of it is amateur. None of it really has investigated the situation. There are a few writings that were surprising to me because they actually did take the trouble to have a closer look. And those that did take the trouble to, to look more closely at the situation concluded that she was not a common prostitute. They concluded that her conjugal lifestyle was different. It was did not amount to what in those days was considered to be a respectable marriage, either in Indian or in Western terms. However, it also makes clear that she is, as one writing puts it, not on all fours with the common prostitute. There are limitations. There is a system within which she exists and carries out her vocation. It is a recognized institution. It's been going for centuries. And 
actually this cannot be dealt with under the heading of vice. It's an, it's an unknown quantity. The, you know, that the kind of things that fell under the headings of vice were very self-evident in India at the time. It wasn't as though the, the Devadasi was the outstanding example. No, the outstanding example was present in the streets, the back streets, the alleys. It was just that the Devarasi was convenient, easy to collar, and uh, a wonderful quasi-romantic type of personality to bring before the court of public opinion and to drag into the law courts. Now, it made the social justice activists work so much easier and indeed more appealing because it was so easy to become controversial about the dancing girl. Much more difficult to become controversial about the common problem of prostitution in the streets because, you know, who were those women? You could not really hold them up and identify them as these spectacular beings, the Devadasis, the Nautch girls, the dancing girls. You see where I'm going with this? They were convenient scapegoats. Now, if you look at the nature of the court case itself, I've looked at the appeal document because Padmavati wasn't settling for a two-year sentence. She decided to appeal her case and it was brought back to the Madras High Court where she was again found guilty, although her sentence was reduced. But if you examine the court document itself, the actual arguments, on which the conviction is confirmed, although the sentence is reduced, you find that it does not prove in any way that she was a prostitute or that she was adopting girl children into a life of prostitution. It simply takes it for granted. It's an a priori dogma. In fact, <laughs> In fact, one of the authorities quoted by that magistrate is none other than the famous Abbe Dubois, who, by the way, died in 1848 and was not around to tell the court, uh, you know, in his personal capacity, what he felt. And uh, so he was, you know, he preceded the court case by some... Uh, or shall we say, by some 60 or 70 years, and yet he's held up as an authority. You know, the Abbe de Bois has said that these women are prostitutes, and therefore, you know, that's the end of the story. There is also some waffle about um, the implicit admission of the accused, and so on and so forth. But nothing that, if you read that paper today, there's nothing in it that convinces you that the court has found what it is accusing her of, that, that the children are being bought and adopted into a life of prostitution. Uh, indeed, what you find with these law courts at the time is that um, they take for granted that she is a criminal simply by birth, by her location. They look no closer. And you find that in the law journal, she is referred to sometimes as the object of rather crass jokes, puerile wit, and uh, you wonder how it's possible that law journals can take a class of people 
about whom they actually don't know anything much in detail, and humanize them in this way in the law journals, which are, you know, uh, compiled and written by lawyers, prosecutors, magistrates, people of the profession, who are publicly uh, mocking her. And you realize that what's really happened here is a kind of nexus has formed between the social justice activists, the anti norch movement, a nexus has formed between them and their ongoing activism and the perceptions that the judiciary has about this person. It's what we see still happening in the world today and throughout history that the courts bow to public opinion and are quite capable of perpetrating injustices because they are under pressure from public opinion. The law against the dedication of minors, girls under 16, to temple practice, was actually enacted in 1860. And the first court case, the first trial of such a case occurred only occurred only nine years later, which doesn't seem to me to show a great deal of enthusiasm on the administrative side and on the court side, you know, to, to deal with these cases. But eventually the activist pressure becomes of such a kind that the courts have to begin to at least uh, make a show of it make a show of dealing with this, because it's important for the activists that the Devadasi be put on trial, because that's a win. That's a win for the cause. Not for the cause against prostitution, which is their big complaint, you know, the, the degradation of women, justified complaint. About that, they actually do very little, if anything at all. I don't find any reports of them worrying much about those back streets and alleys and the ships transporting these women. In fact, J.D. Rees, writing in 1909, says, oh, he, by the way, was an advisor to the governor of Madras. He says, what, what is, what, what's going on with these reformers. Their, their ostensible program is, you know, cleaning up the streets. Their ostensible program is, uh, you know, rescuing women and girls from a degraded life, and yet they're focusing on the dancing girls. And he cannot understand that. And he uh, himself does not uh, take the line that this is at all a good idea. I mean, he feels that it's a distraction from the real problems. But, of course, the social justice activists knew that only too well. They knew it was a distraction. But they needed a victim that was um, accessible because you could get done with her in a way that would really uh, lead to some kind of public excitement, you know. You could have the public condemning the Maharajas and the officials who attended the Norch dances. You could uh, make a fuss about the immorality of men, especially officials, who attended these performances. And so, you could use the Devadasi as leverage to achieve uh, government and judicial compliance with your agenda. Never taking into account that the Devadasi system was not a system of out-and-out -out prostitution. Secondly, 
never taking into account, for example, the traditions and the customary laws that bound the Devadasi's hands in any case. You know, she couldn't become a normal member of society uh, in the sense that when it was proposed that dancing girls should be allowed to enter the schools and have a normal education, there was great uh, dismay on the part of uh, the educated Indian classes, uh, the higher classes, the elites, who said, no, you can't do that. We can't have our daughters attending school with these children because these children will contaminate them. So that idea was quickly taken off the table. So there was no way to filter these people, the Devadasi people, back into society. Their marriages were not recognized. I was looking at some legal documents about that as well. What would happen is someone would marry a Devadasi. This was obviously quite rare, but it happened. And then when it came time for inheritance, uh, her children uh, were um, disinherited and she was taken to court if she made any claims. And the court found that, uh, to, uh, to quote uh, verbatim, a marriage between a Devadasi and a respectable man in society is impossible. Not illegal, but impossible. So there was no way in terms of normative conjugality that she could enter into that kind of social life anyway, even if she had wanted to. She was debarred by the system that obtained around her from taking any other part in public life and private life, actually, than the part she had. So the only way you could really dispose of her then was to wipe her out or put her in jail for a few years and see what happened. I mean, no, no plan was made to re-examine the wider society of which she was a part and say, well, look, if, if we're going to do away with her vocation, then we have to accommodate her in other ways. No. The way was just to keep using her as the convenient victim, as the ideal victim, to further the ends of justice, righteousness, and public morality. And uh, in all of this, she stood alone. She stood completely alone, buffeted this way, buffeted that way, and eventually, as uh, most of those listening to this talk will know, eventually um, done away with one way or another by the society that had chosen her to be the symbol of its own evil and its own hypocrisy, really. Because not only were they fully aware that she wasn't what they were saying of her, or at least partially aware, but they were also aware that they had made no other arrangements for rescuing her from the life that she was ostensibly degrading the society by taking part in. No, uh, none of that was of any interest to them because the main thing was that she could be used and reused and reused for decades and decades and decades as a symbol, a symbol of everything that was wrong, not only with their society, but with themselves.